between concrete walls there's a place for us where we could go where we could be alone between city lights we don't have to fight i want to go do you want to follow there's something in the air i can't explain it but it's there you know but i can't find us in a secret of a fair I don't wanna have to hide no more it shouldn't be unfair I wanna go and I wanna know Do you wanna follow Baby Do you wanna follow Come with me Do you wanna follow Baby can't you see that I wanna go and I wanna know Do you wanna follow We have is real low Aren't you Aren't sick, you sick and, tired and tired of having, of having to fight? I know a place we want to follow There's something in the air I can't explain it but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in a secret of a fair I don't want to have to hide no more It shouldn't be unfair I want to go and I want to know Do you want to follow Baby Do you want to follow Come with me Do you want to follow Baby can't you see that I want to go and I want to know Do you want to follow What's up, everybody? Welcome to the live stream. I hope you're enjoying the music. Uh, for those who are still not, I've, I've used that live stream music as uh, for the last couple of streams. And for those who maybe missed it and are just hearing it for the first time, yes, that really is me singing. I really do sing the no. no that's not me. That's AI. That's AI. Uh, Ghost Branch FPV uh, did that with some AI wizardry. Um, it's uh, dis. It's distressing. <clears throat> it's uh. It's the world is. A very, uh, I mean, I would, I want to say scary, but I, 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 I refuse to adopt a sort of a fearful attitude. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, it's wild. Let's just put it that way. It's wild what AI and machine learning and large language models and all that nonsense can do, and uh, all of the things that we thought we knew about what we could trust about our senses, like. Like, like, like you've read 1984, right? And how they like try to memory hole facts and modify the, the history and knowledge and language to shape people's thoughts. Wow, they, they had no idea, right? Because you could just make anybody say anything. The good news is, the good news is that when the incriminating tapes of me finally come out, complete deniability right it, because anybody f for whom there is literally thousands of hours of footage of voice and video and face i could i could you could show somebody video of me doing anything and i'd be just like that's not me yeah no it looks it looks good it's ai right so that's good that's a plus for me <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, when I let me ask you, chat. When I unmuted the mic and sang along, did you hear it in sync? Because there's a little bit of a delay in my monitor, and I tried to sing along with what I was hearing. I'm curious, was it in sync or was it like delayed? I'm not sure. It was in sync. I killed it. No, it wasn't. Hope Blackheath. Hope Blackheath is here. Hope Blackheath is here. Hope Blackheath is. Uh, I'm gonna make you a moderator. First of all, uh, so that I can always remember how to say your name. I have a uh, a creepy. Wait, didn't I? Who did I just make a moderator? If it wasn't Holt, he's not blue. No, he's a moderator. <laughs> Uh, whenever people, uh, ask me about, you know, who I'd like to go visit or who flies sites I'd like to fly, I think of your videos. Uh, and, uh, I don't know, maybe I need to get out more because, like, I think it's getting creepy that, like, for the last year, for the last year when people say, hey, where would you like to go fly? I say, you know who I, I remember, I saw these videos of whole Blackheath flying these bandos and I thought they were really freaking cool. You know the one with the circles and you were power looping the circles? It just really stuck in my head. And so like for the last year, whenever somebody asks me that, I go, yeah, whole Blackheath. And it's, I think it's gonna start looking like I just sit there at home and oh, whole Blackheath, yes, yes, I will wear his skin. You know, I'd get, okay. You know what I mean? It's a bit a little weird. Like a year later, you haven't found anyone else that you want to talk about. Eh, there you go. If I'm ever if I'm ever in the United Kingdom, I'll uh, I'll look you up. Anyway, um, <laughs> welcome to the stream, everybody. Welcome to the stream. Uh, Cannon Brewery in Sheffield. Sheffield. Yep. This seems about right. Um, um, let's see here. Uh, Blunty. They're asking for Blunty. Put Blunty back on. Okay. Blunty. I summon you. I rub the lamp. Hi, it's me. How's it going? <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting. How you doing, Blunty? The, the chat is demanding you. I think some people don't realize that you're on the news and you're as a as a as a co-host, but you're not on the Q and A stream as a co-host. Yeah, I just chime in a lot, probably more than I should. But no, shut up, shut up. You can chime in whenever you want. Every time you chime in, I appreciate it, and I think you're adding to the stream. Oh my God, FPV Chrissy. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to answer your questions. Um, we're going to answer your questions on the stream. Here they are. They're they're cruising along here. Cruising along. I'm going to be answering them. Actually, I'm going to be answering the questions that Blunty picks out for me. Blunty's queuing them up right here. Queuing them up. I'm going to start answering them in just a minute. We're, of course, going to be answering questions about uh, from the Discord. Like slipping downhill has a question here. Ooh, that's a good one. We're gonna answer some of those here. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, of course, we're gonna answer questions from the super chats. If you guys want to hit the hit the dollar sign down here in the bottom and leave a super chat, that is the way to be sure that I answer your questions. And just so you know, the way that I usually some streams try to read the super chats as soon as they come in, what I try to do is I'll spend maybe 15 20 minutes answering just questions from the from the from the pores. I think that's what we can call them. And uh, then we'll then we'll hit the super chats and we'll just do a big block of super chats, usually around around the half hour mark. So get those super chats queued up and I'll see you then. But in the meantime, we'll take some questions from the uh, probably shouldn't call you pores. I, it's a tongue in cheek, right? You guys know that uh, we got a question here. The hell? Why are they? Why are they do, plenty? Do, do they look like this to you? Do they? What's going on here? Do they look like that? I think. You probably just drug and highlighted them back or something. That, like, if right, you click see the if top I of the... Click. Here we go. Like... Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And should I be control-clicking them to uncue them? No, you should or... just have to click them. Oh, great. I've... And then it'll I've... turn green, I've... and then they'll I've pop up on it. your screen. There we go. Okay. As long as we've been doing this, you'd think I would know how to do it. No comment. <laughs> 
Thank you. Appreciate that. Hi, Joshua. What are the best settings in antenna for ELRS 2.4 gigahertz so I can have the best range? I use Axis Flying Thor 1 watt module, uh, the best settings. Okay, so for the best range, obviously, you want to use the maximum output power. That's the whole point of output power. For the best range, you want to use the lowest packet rate possible. That's going to be 50 hertz. And for the best range, you're going to want to, I mean, you could use a higher gain antenna like a Moxon. Uh, uh, they sell a Moxon antenna, which is a little bit more of a directional coverage, and that'll give you a little bit additional range. However, um, if you're at one watt and 50 hertz, like you shouldn't have to try too hard with the antennas. You should be able to get quite a lot of range. The other thing you got to keep in mind is that you know people go 50, 60 kilometers. Not, I'm not making that up. People have gone that far on ELRS. 2.4 gigahertz and they're doing that under ideal conditions like they're up in the sky line of sight if you're flying and you're too close to the ground or you're behind a building or you're behind a mountain or you're behind some trees all of those things significantly cut into the range and you're not going to get 10 or 12 kilometers of range without like a clear line of sight but that's how you maximize the range max power lowest uh lowest packet rate possible um we got a question here from What's the Matter, who says, Hey, JB, what are your expectations for the DJI 04 goggles and 04 air unit? When do you think they'll release? Um, no idea when they're going to release. Uh, you know, we, 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 I, in a previous live stream clip, you can, Blunty has the live stream clip where I did the DJI hype cycle. I think that's gone up, right? I think so. No, yeah. If not you, 100% on that. If you, if you have the chance to find that and put the link in the chat, that would be super cool. I don't know if you're if you're busy, you know, doing other things, but um, I talked about the DJI hype cycle and how it has a sort of cyclical pattern. I won't go through it all again, but you can kind of predict when the next DJI release is happening by where you are in the DJI hype cycle. And right now we are in the uh, we've seen like suggested prototypes of new goggles, uh, but I don't think we've seen any concrete evidence like. The, the, the leakers who leak actual pictures of product haven't started doing that yet. So uh, I think that we can assume that a new product is coming. I think that as far as timing goes, it's really hard to say. Um, as far as what, what uh, features it'll have, I think uh, we've it's been leaked that it'll have some kind of like, uh, you'll, you'll be able to see like through the screens, it'll have like augmented reality, kind of like the Apple Vision maybe. I don't know. Um, if it does, that would be pretty cool. Rotor Riot showed an example of flying FPV with the Apple Vision uh, headset. The latency was terrible because they were using an HDMI input to a computer. So it was really unflyable. But what was cool is that they had the FPV field here, right? And then like over here, the, in the augmented reality, they could see the drone. So like in theory, are they, are they uh, fulfilling the visual line of sight, uh, the spotter requirement? That's an interesting question. Blunty, weigh in with me here. It requires that you see the aircraft with the unaided eye, right? So an Apple Vision Correct. Pro headset with a camera, even though it's feeding just a regular view, it wouldn't count, would it? Currently it would not count. That's correct. On the other hand, is, yeah, any, yeah, anything at all that your eyes have to go through other than uh, corrective lenses mm -hmm. uh, would count. Now, the question I think a lot of people have asked is like the Apple Vision Pro is a bulky headset, mm -hmm. but like, what? yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know what counts. I think corrective lenses implies that you can only be looking through the lens, not some kind of device that portrays a lens. Yes. Right. I think, but then I think, I think so. you have questions about like how are blind people handled or how are people with poor vision handled to have some kind of implant or like other vision systems or like I don't I don't know if there's any case law on that. Sure. You know what I mean? Like we yeah. could go deep down that that rabbit hole. I I'm gonna suspect though that any arguments we're gonna get a lot farther with pass through vision systems than we will with other cases. No question. Because, I, I, yeah. I, I I think that like if you take something like the Epson Moviero goggles which most people haven't heard of those. I only know about it because Epson tried to get me to do a video about it. And I was like, yeah, I don't think this is very interesting. I mean, it's cool, but it's not for FPV pilots. But what they are is basically a clear lens that you can literally see through 
and then it projects a screen into the lens. And in that case, if you were seeing the drone in your peripheral vision, there's no question that you are seeing it with your unaided eye. It is passing through a clear pane of glass, but it's not a lens or a telescope or binoculars or anything like that. I think what they're trying to avoid is a situation where you have the drone very, very far away and you are using some kind of magnifying situation like a camera or a telescope or a binoculars that limits your peripheral vision and you're like, oh, I can see. Because what they're concerned about is situational awareness. Never mind the argument that I have much better situational awareness in the FPV feed than I do line of sight. They don't buy that. And so that that sort of ship has sailed. But Blunty, I, I, do, I do think that something that is essentially passing through unmodified maybe has a chance of getting approved. Hmm? Uh, I don't know. I mean, e technically- What does unmodified it, mean? Well, like, let's say that it has a similar field of view and magnification to the unaided eye, okay? But I have a camera and I am putting it on a screen in front of you. I have the same peripheral vision. You see what I mean? So my situational awareness and my ability to fly far away, like the distance at which I can no longer perceive the aircraft is the same or less. Is then, there an argument for the ability of that pass through to fail or something? I mean, I'm just like devil's advocate at this point, but like your fair. eyes can't fail and not well, let you see the quad in an emergency. So yeah, the, but but you're you're already if allowed it's an to active emergency, and all of a sudden your pass through starts to die in your headset along with the vision that you need to fly the drone. Then you've got to rip the headset off, and you don't have BVLOS is, until you do. I is don't know. the is yeah. the FAA's expectation that you would be able to fly line of sight? Like, let's say you've got a situation where, so my, uh, this is an interesting argument, although I don't know how much time we need to spend arguing about interpreting the FAA's rules as if there's some kind of right. weird role-playing game that we're trying to, yeah. like, win. <laughs> but the FAA's concern is situational awareness. That's why they don't want the FPV pilot, because the FPV pilot can't see to the side and behind them. They want the spotter, and the spotter's main job I is looking for traffic, Right. I'll, yeah, but I'll just say, like, I would argue that that's not even in the understanding or lexicon of, like, like, I, I understand what you mean where you say when you have the goggles on, but they don't, like, differentiate, I don't think. I think the whole idea is, like, unless you can see the thing, you're not, you know, you're mm -hmm. not valid. I don't think it's yeah. because of, like, awareness or directionality. Like, they don't consider the vision we have out of the drone to be aiding us at all in helping right. identify anything. Right. I think that's but, a, but, a good point to point out. You know? Your concern is that if the glasses fail, then you couldn't fly. But like, let's say right. I've got an FPV goggles on and a spotter, right? That's legal. Now, let's say right. my FPV feed fails. The spotter isn't right. going to help me land the craft. I'm going to crash or activate or turn to home. So that's no different than if I'm flying as my own spotter with a pass through that fails. At the moment that my feed I, fails... The, the person who has visual can't fly the aircraft. Yeah, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what's the actual effective difference of lifting your goggles to see where your drone is and putting them back down to fly versus having passed through constantly. Yeah. Like, anyway, interesting. That can fail. But yeah, I, I think I think I'm going to guess that most of this won't be tested in court first. It'll be written in some kind of documentation for BVLS sure. uh, from like the BVLS ARC or the different groups that have been doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but our ultimate goal, I'll just say our ultimate goal in this BVLS conversations have always been to prove that the goggles provide more awareness than you would have normally because you have a camera on the drone and you can move, you know, twice, mm -hmm. twice a second around in a circle to get an yeah. identifier of the area. So. Yeah. All righty. Well, enough about enough about the FAA. Interesting. Oh, right. We were talking about the DJI, new DJI system rumored to have uh, augmented reality of some kind. And then, I, like, I don't know, like, what else are they going to come up with? There's always some, like, you know, like there was originally the ability to stream video to the goggles, too, but then it got removed to the Integra. I, I mean, I think that ultimately what we've seen DJI do in the past is from the V2 to the G2, we saw an incremental improvement in the performance of the system, yeah, more than incremental. We went from 720p to 1080p. We had 4K onboard recording. Um, I, you know, it, I'm not sure how much further they can go in terms of the FPV feed. Like, I, I don't think that the technology exists to go to a 4K 
feed like i would be i would like that would require so much bandwidth and and so i just don't see that happening i'd be shocked if it did um so probably some incremental improvement in the in the range and resolution rumors of, of ar pass-through although who knows if that's substantiated and as far as date goes who freaking knows could be two months from now could be six months from now we just don't know it seems like from where we are in the hype cycle that it is further out than nearer, but you just can't predict. Um, okay, uh, we're having this question, uh, and I'm just gonna head this off. FPV Chrissy says, what do you think about open IPC? Um, here's the thing. Blunty, that clip went up, right? Yes, it did. Okay, so I want, I, I, I what do you, I uh, am not, I think that uh, oh, the short answer is, and here's the long answer is in this clip, and you can open it in the second window. Don't click away from my stream. I need the analytics. Um, but if you want the long answer, there it is. The short answer is that OpenIPC is not a usable consumer product at this time. It is barely a usable hobbyist product. You know, it is an enormous amount of work to get it working, and then when it is working, no one knows how well it works because it has only been tested and demonstrated in a very narrow set of situ circumstances, okay? Like, for example, currently, the receiver that you use to view the feed is a laptop, not a set of goggles. Now, I know people are going to say, oh, they're working on that. It's going to get better. Yeah, they are. In fact, it's kind of amazing. If you look at the OpenIPC uh, project, it's kind of amazing how much work is going into this. The Open IPC Alliance, right? And we've got these contributors here, right? Like, it's actually a shocking amount of work that's going into it. So somebody is very, very interested in this project. And who knows what it will become in the future? It may become something very good in the future. But right now, it is way too preliminary, okay? It is way too preliminary for like, I'm not even, like every time I think about making a video about it, it's just, it's like, oh my God, this is, no one's, no one's gonna do this. Okay, if you're one of the one in a thousand people or maybe less who wants to do it, more power to you. No one's gonna do it. And if it gets to a point where I feel like here we got a new, here we got some pictures here from John Goblin. Here's the new camera. Oh, and here, oh, very interesting. The new VRX, interesting, very interesting. If it gets to a point where I feel like it's like st stable enough to test, then I will test it. But right now it is extremely preliminary and I just think it's moving too fast. Even if I were to test it and it sucked or was great, in six weeks or two months, it might be different or better. It's just too soon. And you as a hobbyist who are like, what, open IPC, you're hoping that it will destroy DJI and it'll be the next greatest thing. And who knows, maybe it will, but it's not there yet and it's not time to hope for that yet. That's my opinion. Look how beta flight came out. Open IPC could eventually be great. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe not. I would like to say, though, there is a big difference between open source software and open source hardware. Open source software is easy in that all it takes is time. And I put air quotes around that because anybody who's worked on an open source project knows that it's like a shitload of time and energy and sweat. And I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But you can just sit down and grind out code uh, if you because everyone in the world has 24 hours a day to spend on whatever they decide to spend it on and some people decide to spend a lot of that time writing code more power to you but hardware is hard haha -ha. hardware open source hardware does not scale like open source software does because you write one piece of open source code and you put it out in the world and everyone can use it. But you create a piece of open source hardware, you still have to pay money to build it. And that's that's a, a stumbling block that is a lot. When you look at the wildly successful open source projects, 
a lot, not all of them, a lot of them are software based. And open source hardware projects, there has to be some oomph behind them to get them moving. And we that has yet to happen for OpenIPC. Okay. All right. For more of my top my thoughts about OpenIPC, go to the link that I gave. And that we're not going to talk about OpenIPC again. It sucks because there's so much interest in it that as a YouTube creator, I want to, yes, let's talk about it. Give me the views. If I were to release a video that said, Open IPC destroys DJI, it's amazing, use it now. It would get a million views and I would be clickbaiting you and lying because that's not true. It is a hobby project. It's not even a hobby project. It is a lab project on a bench somewhere. And the real question, the real, like, I'm like, why, why, why is it being pushed as hard as it is for how crappy and preliminary as it is? There's a part of me that's like suspicious. You go in to buy a car and the car is half the price you think it should be. And no one's bought it yet. And it's been on the market for th th three weeks. The listing's been up and you go and the guy's like, yeah, here it is. Yeah, I know it's a great price. And you're like, what aren't you telling me? And I kind of feel that way about open IPC. What aren't they telling me? Why is like one YouTuber so interested in pushing this and no one else has tried it and no one else is making content about it? I know why I'm not making content about it. Mm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, moving on. Alex Scolovino says the DJI FPV V2 goggles are sold out. You can still get them used and refurbished in some places. What's the next batch digital FPV goggle? Well, if you are part of the DJI ecosystem, then the goggles two or the Integra is the way to go. If you're looking about at moving away from DJI, I think walk snail. If you're already a fan of DJI, then the next best thing is walk snail. Like, but because the only two choices are Walksdale or HD Zero, and Walksdale just technologically works very similarly to DJI. Uh, Andre asks, do you know how to make the black box and OSD both work? Andre, I'm going to guess that you're using a SpeedyB V3 flight controller. So the Speedy, uh, Blunty, was it the V3 that had this bug? I believe so. I think so too. The SpeedyB F405 V3. And I believe that that specific flight controller had a bug where you could not use black box and OSD at the same time. If you put the SD card in the SD card reader, the OSD stopped working. And Blunty, I don't remember a fix. Do you? Like, was there a CLI option you could use or a fix for it? Or were you just, no, screw you? I think they wired it to like the same internal pin. So I don't think there was a solution. I think it was, you have to pick one or the other. I think so. So basically with that, with the then, V3, it's fixed in the V4. Right, on Good. the new hardware it's fixed, but I think I'm, I don't I don't believe there's an option to run both. Yeah, so Andre, unfortunately you are just out of luck on that one. You just basically have to assume that flight controller doesn't have black box. You could get an external black box recorder, like just a little data flash chip or SD card, they make them. You could get an external SD uh, recorder, wire it up to a UART, and then you could record black box that way. What's the... Like, it's been so long. I'm trying to remember what, like, a recent... There's, there's like, a couple of them out there, but... Yeah, the Meyerbot Open Logger. That's it. So this chip, this device, the Open Logger, L-A-G-R, not L-O-G-G. There is another thing called the Open Logger, L-O-G-G, and it is not the one you want. The Open Logger has up to five megabit per second, I think, uh, reading, as, and so it can it can read a lot faster. All right, I'm gonna make a crazy suggestion. Yep. Is just turn the OSD off, do your black box logging, tune the drone, turn the OSD back on, right? I don't like that suggestion. That's practical. <laughs> I don't accept practicality. As a, I wanna fix problems, not just anyway. No, that's a good suggestion. 
Thank you, Plenty. I'm glad you're 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 great. You're great. Uh, like I'm all like like well, here's the technical solution to the blow, and you're like, why don't you just do the thing? And I'm like, oh yeah, that that's way that'll just get it done. It's not like the optimal solution. It's just the one that works and is easy. <laughs> also, uh, Xscape says INF fix that possibly in INF seven. So maybe it isn't a uh, maybe it is a software issue. But either way, uh, that might be a possibility as well. Okay. Okay. All right, Andre, thank you for the question. Um, oh, my God, it's one thirty. I babbled for way too long. We have 29 questions. It's time for me to get to Super Chats. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to read Super Chats until I run out of Super Chats. There are currently seven Super Chats. If you want to hear your question answered promptly, leave a Super Chat now. When I run out of Super Chats, I will go back to reading the regular chats. Hmm. Ooh, Night Owl, good question. This is not a super chat. Night Owl in the Discord asks, since the OSD chips are not required when using HD video, would it make sense we stop putting them on flight controllers and start having them on the VTX instead? That's a very interesting idea, Night Owl. Um, there have been, when DJI first came out, there were many flight controllers that left the analog chip off because it wasn't needed anymore. That trend has, uh, has died out because... The idea that you're going to sell a flight controller and it cannot have OSD with analog, there's just too many analog pilots still out there. And it, it was too, it fragmented the marketplace too much. And so t these days, most all flight controllers come with an analog chip on there. The savings weren't worth it. Now, your idea that we should put the chip on the VTX, I know one video transmitter in history that did that. It was made by uh, the company that made the LaForge goggle module. Uh, what the hell was the name of that company? They had a VTX and it had a built-in OSD uh, and it would just draw the OSD for you. This was back when many flight controllers didn't have an OSD chip. I think that um, that's an interesting idea, but you would then just end up with redundancy because all the flight controllers also have the OSD chip and you would need a protocol to configure the OSD, but that kind of already exists for digital VTXs, so maybe it would work. I just think that that's the kind of cultural shift that isn't gonna happen though. Because if manufacturers start taking the chips off of the flight controller, now that you have to like snap your fingers and all at once all flight controllers don't have osd chips and all video transmitters do and that transition is going to be way too unwieldy and just isn't going to happen it's a good idea though i'm going to make a much uh, better suggestion i think which is that everybody should just start using g4s or h7s that have the ability to do osd drawn by the CPU instead of having it drawn by the OSD chip, and then you have your cake and eat it too because you just draw it from the MCU directly. You can yeah. use something like Dominic Clifton's Pixel OSD and draw fancy graphics. Well, you don't have to worry about a register in the OSD chip or, or working with a Max chip or anything. Yeah, so. but you have to use an H7 or a G7. G4, Why I think, can do it. Well, G4, I'm sorry, G4. Yeah. Why aren't more flight controllers using H7s? I imagine costs because we're seeing yeah. people try to get AT32s to get down, you know, even yeah. lower costs as opposed to yeah. in the other direction. But yeah. All right. Um, here we go. Please shout out Julian Noozles 3D. He hacked the Bamboo AMS to print flawless multicolor TPU. Link in your Discord. Thank you for $5 super chat. Steve Tricks. And thank you for being a Discord member. Uh, Noozle 3D. Noozle 3D is. Uh, let me. Noozle 3D. Uh, shout out to Noozle 3D in general. Uh, his uh, owner of this company is named Julian. Uh, I can't remember his last name right here at the, at the minute. Uh, Julian, though, is his first name, and he prints all kinds of stuff. He uh, is the the producer of Rotoriot prints, but he'll do just about anything if you ask him to. And uh, he also does prints for my frame. Uh, good guy and a good 3D printer. Um, and he switched to the bamboo, uh, from the Couldn't Prusa Mark done, III. I figured it. He switched from the, from the Prusa Mark III to bamboo, sold all his Prusas. Uh, did he sell them all? I think he did. And bought, uh, bamboo printers. And for somebody who runs a print farm, boy, that's a hell of a, a bold move. Like, it must have been a financial choice. 
and it must be better. Like, he's clearly not a shill if he moved his whole company over. But one of the limitations of the bamboo is that the AMS, which is their multi-material system, where you can print different uh, colored filament or different filament types, doesn't work with flex filament. Apparently, he has tweaked it, and I'm curious enough to see, like, how he did it. Allen wrench, a, and something to pull out some... Yeah, okay. So... So First we're going to take gonna the AMS take apart. AMS. We're not going to watch the whole video. There's a couple of um, there's a couple of wires that you don't want to yank. So essentially, the way to remove yeah, these okay. is okay. I had to do this once when I had a broken off piece of filament jammed in my AMS. Both of them. Spring removal. Now we Second have... spring removal. So he's removing some springs. Be careful with tightening these screws too much. They're just going right into plastic, so they can't. Final easily. spring removal heavy. Just take your time. I'm using a little wait, wait. motorized screwdriver, just which takes some helps springs out. Like automatic torque sensor. Chat. I'm not going to watch Make the whole sure thing here on stream. Is that what does he do? Somebody sum it up for me, chat. Save Let's me. The cable back in. And for the sake of the video, I already did the last two, but you would go ahead and just do the same thing for these two. This is the most important spring that we're going to loosen. This is the spring that will Loosening cause the entire print to jam. So we're going to go ahead, remove this plastic piece, and we're going to remove I the six ask him. silver screws. Now he prints a lot of TPU. I wonder if this affects your ability. Once you have your printer, there's one more really important step to do. We're going to go to Bamboo Studio, click this. Uh, carrot and then go to preferences and right here there's there is a skip ams blacklist check what does that and mean by default bamboo studio is not going to let you send tpu to your ams but by oh. checking this box <laughs> you'll be able to send any kind of filament all right that's unsupported as you can tell the process is pretty easy okay i'm uh, this is intriguing i print a lot of tpu as well the ability to run tpu in the ams is exciting um they can check this video out i'll post a link in the Discord and in the YouTube chat, uh, if you want to check it out. I see. Willpower says it's reversible, but it doesn't allow other filaments. So you can't go back and forth between TPU and other f and rigid filaments. I see. Well, uh, there's only one thing for it, you know. Uh, store. There's only one thing for it. AMS. I just need to drop $350 on a new AMS. Clearly, right? <laughs> I have one AMS for TPU and one for rigid filaments, and I never have to change a filament again. <laughs> no. Uh, one IFPV says I didn't want to watch the video, so I just asked Google Gemini to summarize it for me. Shut the fight. The, the, the future is the future is fucking weird. All right. Well, thank you, Julian from News uh, Newsle Three D. Sean England, thank you for a five dollars super chat. Uh, dead on with the Barrow GPS altitude issues. Now I'm having issues getting mag oriented properly. Any tips on getting it aligned? Yes. Okay. So in Betaflight, you're going to go to the sensor alignment section of the configuration tab. In iNav, there's a whole separate alignment tab. I'm going to assume that you know where these things are, but there is the place where you put the alignment. So here's what you do. The first thing you do is you go outside and you face north. And if your compass isn't, you put your, you got to put your compass heading in the OSD. So you got the goggles on your face, you face north. If the compass says that it's facing north, good to go. If the compass doesn't say that it's facing north, then you have an offset. So you're going to make a note of your offset, okay? Let's let's say that you're facing north, but it says you're facing east. Well, now you have a 90-degree offset, right? Okay, so now you've got your offset. Then the next thing you do is you face north, and then you turn to the left. And if it, if it goes north to east, you're good to go. But if when you turn towards the east, the compass turns towards the west, that means it's flipped upside down, okay? 
So it's the two things you do. Number one, you make note of the offset, and number two, you make note of if it's flipped. And then you go back in Betaflight or INEV and you put those, put those transforms in, plus 90 degrees, 180 flip. And then you go back and you check. Face north, north. Turn to the right, east. Turn to the left, west. You're good to go. The other thing is that um, the compass in INAV, you also, well, Betaflight will do this too, but I don't know how sensitive Betaflight is to this, but you want the compass to be aligned with the flight controller, okay? So if the compass is tilted down like this, like for because the GPS is tilted down, then you need to put, put that uh, adjustment in as well. Okay. Um, Mr. Dud, thank you for a $5 super chat. I connected my 1S flight controller to upgrade the ESCs and my battery ran out on the fourth ESC and now it doesn't read. Oh, um, I mean, if you can't flash it, I mean, you could try to flash it. And sometimes there's an option, uh, force, force, uh, MCU. What's the option? Oh, it's not very helpful, Bardwell. I think it's ignore MCU something, right? Ignore something like incorrect MCU. Way out. Let's see if I can find a reference. Ignore inappropriate MCU. Yep. So here's a situation where a dude's uh, ESC flash failed and it's boned. You can try to force flash it, but there's an option ignore inappropriate mcu slash layout and you can so, try and force the flash and if, if that works great and if that doesn't work i think you're boned go ahead blunty yeah i would just say typically that only works if it actually detects a fourth but you get an invalid target on it right so you get yeah, like garbled well, gunk like if it's not seeing the fourth mapped at all you're not going to be able to flash to it probably I mean, you're right, but I like, yeah, you've you're got right. to see it in the config to flash it is what I mean. So if you if you open the config, you've got three motors and not a fourth, then you're not going to be able to flash it to get out of that. Yeah, and unfortunately, right. at that point, I think you have to see two flash. To, to yeah, save so ESC if it's like a that. if it's a BL Heli S ESC, there is a thing called C2 flash. And it can resurrect. Actually, Oscar Liang's guide is better than mine sorry wrong screen oscar liang's guide is better than mine flash bl heli c2 interface look at this page and think to yourself do i want to do these things and if so great if not yeah if it's a bl heli 32 esc then there you my understanding is bl heli 32 should always be flashable that flashing should not brick the bootloader but for BL Heli S, you might need to C2 flash it. But but there is that old method that I just learned about from this, from your live stream while we were doing this like a few weeks ago, right? You, it was some old method you talked about that actually works for BL Heli 32. Uh, you, I think you were t talking about the no. You're they're thinking about the um, four way interface flashing with an Arduino, but there's yes. no difference between the four way interface and the pass through. Oh, uh, I see. It, uh, the four-way interface is just another way of accessing the bootloader. But Betaflight um, essentially does that now anyway. So you're yes, not... Betaflight is essentially, I'm not going to say emulating a four-way interface because I don't think they actually are identical. Gotcha. But the four-way interface is just an alternative to Betaflight pass-through, but it doesn't unlock any additional functionality as far as I know. Uh, 10 four. Okay. And yeah. for people who don't know yet, BLI 32 is licensed. That's why you can't just reflash it directly from right. the pins. Correct. You could flash AM30. If you had, I mean, theoretically, if you had a bricked BL Heli 32 ESC, you could flash AM32 to it by 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 accessing by programming the MCU directly. So you you would you would not AM32 is open source code that runs on many, if not all, BL Heli 32 targets. But uh, yeah. All right. Sorry, we don't have a better answer for you, but thank you for the donation. Uh, Jack Russell, thank you for five pounds. Uh, is it possible to build a five inch using a 6S 40 amp JHMC AIO? Yes. Yes, you could do that. Um, like, it's a given that AIOs are less durable than standalone ESCs. Why is that? Because the more things you cram onto a board, the less reliable it is. Why is that? I don't know. It's just an observation. 
And I think most people would tell you that it's true. I think you could do it and it might last for a long time and it might not. I wouldn't recommend it. But if you're just sitting there, you know, like you just you're just sitting there in a hotel room with nothing to do and you've got motors and a frame and a video transmitter and a camera and the only flight controller you've got is this all in one. And you're like, I just feel like building a quad today. Yeah, go for it. You tell me if it you tell me if it lasted. Quad City Bay Area. Flight controller don't have enough ground. Can I use a TX RX as a ground? Thank you for five dollars. No, 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 you know. Okay, first of all, first of all, no. A TX RX is not a ground. It that's no. Ground is a ground. And second of all, what do you mean not enough ground? You can solder all your wires to the same ground pad if you want to. There's no rule that says you can only solder one wire to each ground pad. Quad City Barria, today you're the one in 10,000. <laughs> uh, what is it? XKCD, one in 10,000. Quad City Bay Area, today you're the one in 10,000. I try not to make fun of people for admitting they don't know things. Because for each thing everyone knows, by the time they're adults, every day there are on average 10,000 people in the U.S. hearing about the thing for the first time. You're one of today's lucky 10,000. You can solder as many wires to a ground pad as you want. Now, eventually... Eventually, you have so much current flowing through the pad that it's damaged. So, like, you wouldn't want to solder all your ESC wires to a single little ground pad on the flight controller. It, it would melt. But for things like signal for your receiver, for your video transmitter, the amount of power they're pulling is so small, you just take an additional ground pad and you're good to go. James Who, if you are commenting about the open logger, you're behind on the stream or you're responding to someone in the chat who's asking a question. It's always funny to me when people are leaving leaving comments behind on the stream. Spooky, thank you for uh, 100 check Karuna. My problem is that I have four LEDs and I have the settings correct in beta flight, but only one of them lights up. Sometimes, but only sometimes another one lights up. What should I do? Um, Spooky, thank you for the donation. This is not going to be a problem that we can troubleshoot easily on the live stream. It's going to require me to check your wiring. So you're going to have to send me a picture. I'm going to check your wiring. I'm going to look at your beta flight configuration. I'm going to ask you what kind of, uh, there's going to be all kinds of questions I have to ask you and answers you have to ask me. And we, it's too slow to do that on a live stream. It's not a, it's not a good use of time. So please email me jb at joshuabardwell.com. Anybody, anybody can email me jb at joshuabardwell.com. Uh, and I try to answer questions regardless of if you've super chatted, but especially if you've super chatted, I don't want you to have wasted your donation. And so please email me and we'll go through it and try and fix it, but we're not going to do it here on the live stream. Sorry about that. Vikas, thank you for a hundred rupees. Uh, built my first FPD quad after watching your videos for four years. Oh, that, that does my heart good. Thank you so much for, for letting me know. And I hope you enjoy the hobby. Uh, how many astronauts can you name from memory? Thank you for $2, uh, Stallion Butter. Uh, well, Neil Armstrong, right? Uh, Sherry Ride? Sherry Ride? The teacher, she was the teacher who went up on the Challenger. Uh, there's that bald Sally guy. Ride. Sally, Sally Ride? Ride? Well, I don't get credit for that, right? Do I get half credit for Sally Ride? Um, she was like the first woman, I think. And then she blew up, unfortunately. It's a sad, uh, if I'm remembering right. I remember the Challenger explosion vividly. Uh, I remember that it happened. I, like, I wasn't there, but it was, it was a, a moment of my childhood. Sally Ride. Uh, I, f I feel ba sad that I can't remember the other guys who are up there with Neil Armstrong. I'm trying to remember in Apollo 14, what were the, what were the astronauts' names? Um, uh, there's the guy, there's the bald guy who spent a lot of time in space and did a lot of advocacy, 
but I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Buzz Aldrin, yeah. Right, Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin, famous for punching a moon landing denier. <laughs> okay, now everybody else is helping. No, 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 it's helping. Um, so basically two. Two. Two astronauts. That's how many I can name. Um, oh, I assumed you meant American astronauts. Sure, Yuri Gagarin. Gagarin, uh, you know. Mark Kelly. There you go. I, I feel bad for not knowing Mark Kelly's name. I've seen enough of his content. I should know his name. That's it. Two. Two is the answer. And uh, I probably could have thought remembered Yuri Ga Gagarin. Uh, except that I assumed you meant Americans because I'm an American and obviously all trivia questions only pertain to America. Clearly. Um, moving on. El Chingon asks, is there a problem using 14 AWG battery wires on a 6S cinematic quad using blah, 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 blah. Uh, thank you for $5 super chat, El Chingon. Uh, the question, uh, none of the information that you're giving me, it's a 6S mid-range cinematic quad using a flight controller, et cetera, et cetera. None of that is in any way relevant to the question of whether you can use 14 gauge wires. And I, I say that because I want you to understand what actually goes into answering this question. You need to know how much current will be flowing from the battery. And the way to answer that is largely to do with the motors and props. So what I would want to know is what battery are you using and what wire gauge is on the battery? And in general, as a rule of thumb, you should use the same wire gauge that's on the battery or maybe one size smaller as long as you keep your battery lead relatively short. Okay, that's it. Now, if you wanted to really get into it, you could look at how many amps your motors were pulling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want to encourage you not to go, do not, I want to discourage you from going to a, an ampacity chart an ampacity chart like this one. Do not do this. Wire gauge amp rating chart. This is for wire gauges in like cars or sometimes the ampacity chart is for wire gauge in the wall. A quadcopter, the, the the limitation for the ampacity of a wire is largely the heat buildup in the wire. And a quadcopter XT60 lead, number one, it is very short, okay? So it has very little resistance, okay? All these, all these measurements are for two foot up to 50 foot, okay? We're talking about six inches maybe, okay? So immediately we've bought ourselves a significant amount of ampacity. And number two, we are flying a quadcopter at 70, 80 miles an hour. There is a ton of airflow cooling it, okay? So these charts are worthless. And finally, in most cases, we're not gonna pull 60, 80, 100, 150 amps for very long. Now. If you're building a big, heavy Cinelifter that's gonna pull 80 amps at cruise, then that's a different story. But for a five inch drone, like you can spec 14 gauge wire and you can pull 150 amps through it for 30 seconds, for 25 seconds, and then your battery's dead or you're done with that run. So in short, 14 gauge, look at your battery the manufacturer has sized your battery with a wire gauge that they think is appropriate. Use that wire gauge or maybe one size smaller. That's my recommendation. Evan Daniel, thank you for a dollar super chat. Evan Daniel asks, I'm new to FPV and I'm looking to build a 6S 5 inch with a Speedy B stack and an O3. I wanna go fast even if I crash, what motors should I get? Yeah, great, great question, Evan. I'm gonna suggest you go to my website, fpvknowitall.com. That's not the right page. There we go. Uh, and under my F ultimate FPV shopping list, there's recommendations for freestyle and racing drones. Since you're very worried about going fast, 
we'll go to the racing page and we'll click on motors. And here are some good motors that can get you going good and fast. There you go. FPVKnowItAll.com. Um, Oscillation Andy, thank you for a $10 super chat. Very generous. Uh, I've been a frame snob and only fly Catalyst Machine Works frames for years, but I'm retiring my fleet this year for lack of parts. Yeah, Catalyst Machine Works got bought or merged with this other company, and they basically, like, I don't know what they're doing, but it seems like they're not as active on the hobby side anymore. Um, that's my impression. Where should I look for new freestyle and racing frames? Go ahead, Blunty. I, you I think to you just in. made an announcement that they're going to start making free cell frames again. Somebody just sent me a message about that like two weeks ago. Yeah, I got an email from them about spare parts. An update. Uh, yeah, here we go. Hang on. Well, I got this. That's 3D printing at Brain3D. And Surge at Pyrodrone just got a big shipment of carbon and other spares. It just seems like that's not where their heart is lately. Like, not where their top attention is. I don't know. Um, if you're looking for a new freestyle and racing frames, well, what a great opportunity for me to plug my website, fpvknowitall.com, home of the ultimate FPV shopping list. We got recommendations for five inch freestyle frames of various types. And uh, you know, why is the Volador not? I hate, I hate how often I'm surprised. I'm like, I thought I added the Volador. I thought I added the Volador to this list and yet I don't see it. I am so out of touch. I'm just like, uh, add the Volador. Making myself a note. It's my freaking, I'm so bad at my job. Why am I so successful? Blunty, you have an opinion? <laughs> YouTube doesn't have performance reviews. <laughs> I mean, I must be doing something right. But like in so many ways, I'm terrible at my job. I'm just, I'm like, oh yeah, Volador is going to be on my, why is the Volador not on my webpage? Who is responsible for adding things to this webpage? Oh, it's me. Why? Why am I responsible for this? Why is no one taking this job away from me? Bloody, you want to run my webpage? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, <laughs> because because whenever I think about handing off responsibility for some part of my business to someone else, either they suck at it and I don't want them to do it or they won't do it because they know it's a pain in the ass <laughs> or they want to be paid a fair wage, which I'm not about that. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so bad. My job. Do you know how many how many products I have over there that people sent me that they wanted me to review that I haven't reviewed? And like I don't know why I feel like that makes like on so that should make me good at my job because I'm not being like just a oh a bought and paid for shill who reviews anything he gets for free. Like, it should be me having integrity, but I just look at it and go, isn't my whole job to, like, review products and make content? And I don't do that. What do I do? It's babble on live streams. Isaac Pearson, thank you for a $5 super chat. I've been trying to build a drone and it won't fly. How do I get my FlySky FSI 6B to show up in beta flight? I have an iFly 6 blah, blah, blah. Okay, um, you got a couple of hoops you got to jump through. I'm going to try and help you with the simple version of the hoops you got to jump through, uh, but you might need to end up emailing me to finish it. Maybe you'll get lucky. The first thing you got to do is you got to flash your flight controller. And here in the flashing options under radio protocol, you have to select 
iBus. Okay, iBus. You got to reflash it and select iBus. Otherwise, your your receiver outputs iBus. Your receiver can also output SBus, but iBus is better. If you plan to use SBus, then you would choose SBus. But you have to pick one of those two because by default, neither iBus nor SBus are included when you flash. So you got to do that. So let's let's just do that real quick. Um, we'll do iBus load online. Any minute now, any minute now, any minute now. The hell? Are you joking? What the hell? Come on. What are we doing? What are we doing? Why are I we? Think it's, I think it's building it because it doesn't have a built copy. Oh, shit. It has, to, it has to compile it because no one has <laughs> run iBus on this flight controller and it's not pre-compiled. I see the status right here. I was like, why isn't it downloading faster? This is the first time in history anyone has run Betaflight 4.5 with iBus on the JBF 7v2. That's hilarious. Thank you, Blunty, for pointing that out. Flash firmware. Ignore the risk. This is a throwaway flight controller, so it doesn't matter. And by throwaway, I mean it's just one I keep in my desk for demos. I don't mean that I literally throw away flight controllers because I'm a... I'm a I'm a I'm a spoiled creator. Oh, what's this? What's this? Oh. Eh. Eh, I probably don't need that. Oh, what's this? No. Oh, eh, eh. oh. What about this one? Nah. I've just pissed off someone royally. You guys are so easy. If you're pissed off right now, you got played. It's a joke. <laughs> and then he threw the flight controllers behind him like he doesn't even care. And I think one of them was a KISS flight controller. That means Bardwell hates KISS. Oh, that Bardwell. So disrespectful. So then in the ports tab... Um, you're going to wire iBus to a UART RX, not the SBus pad, but a standard UART RX. If you have a flight controller that only has an SBus pad, then you're going to have to use SBus, okay? Um, but assuming you're using iBus, you'll do that. You'll enable serial RX for that UART number. And then you will go to the receiver tab and you will choose iBus protocol. That's it. Um, the other thing is that most FlySky receivers can output both SBus and iBus. And so you will need to go, you might need to go into your menus in your controller and find that where to change that setting uh, to make sure it's outputting the correct protocol. That's the short version of how to do it. Blunty, what does the chat think of my disrespectful treatment of the flight controllers? Anybody, nobody in the nobody in the chat is going to be fired up about that, right? It's, yeah, I think they're okay. It's the people on Facebook who are going to clip it and and use it as an example of what a bad person I am. Good thing I have a strong ego and a good sense of humor. Uh, thank you for a 40 rupee super chat. Uh, can an X8 configuration have two different KV motors? Yeah, it can. But the overall performance of the aircraft is going to be limited by the weakest motor that it has. So if you have a bunch of 2100 kV motors and then one 1700 kV motor, basically the whole aircraft is going to act like they're all 1700 kV motors. The other motors will just never reach full throttle. But you can do it and it will work. It's not ideal. Jesus Electrotechnica, thank you for two euros. Unburnable ESC 4 and 1 50 amp BL32 price, no matter. You really got a lot of detail in that two euros. They only give you like 50 characters. There's no such thing as an unburnable ESC. I'm not going to promise you that. I would be lying. And anybody who does promise you that is lying. So let's be realistic here. If you want a super durable BL32 ESC, though, what I would do, and I swear to God, this is not just 
another attempt to plug my website. Hey! I swear to God, I'm actually... Um, if you go to the racing section, the ESCs that are on this page are... They come from a survey done by Sean Ames of MultiGP at MultiGP Nationals. So these are the flight controllers and ESCs that the top racers use. And therefore, they are probably the most durable because these are racers just beat the crap out of their gear to a degree that like nobody, un, nobody else does. Now, these are all 20 millimeter because all racers run 20 millimeter. Is that a problem for you? Do you want a 30 millimeter? Uh, I would go with the same manufacturer. I would go with the 30 millimeter Hobby Wing, the 30 millimeter Reaper, the 30 millimeter T Motor F55, right? The 30 millimeter Acon. I would go with those same manufacturers. There you go, though. Tech Monkey, thank you for a $5 super chat. I was told that one of the four Walksdale antenna is TX only. Which of the four is TX on the Dominator HD? Um, I'm pretty sure it's not TX only. I'm pretty sure it's TX RX. Uh, you have an opinion about that, Blunty? I don't know for Walksdale. Okay, I'm going to look for... Mad I know that Madstech has the final word on these. And in fact, today yay. we're going to be talking about these, the new Fat Shark Dominator sure Digital enough. FPV goggles that are compatible with the Avatar HD system from Walks System. Boom. Sorry, Madstech. Uh, thank you to Madstech for doing all this amazing research that I can piggyback off of. Madstech, the next time I see you, please remind me that I owe you a five five dollar uh, super chat in the form of whatever form you prefer. Uh, I'd love to. I'd love to meet Madstech someday. I think. Uh, Oh, I think we could get along for at least a half hour. Um, he's Welsh, right? I'd go to Wales. I've never been to Wales. My kid used to watch Fireman Sam when he was young, though, and I got a very good impression of Wales and Welsh people, especially Welsh firefighters. Anyway, uh, it looks like... Oh, no, it just says TX. There you go. It looks like Antenna 1 is the TX... Uh, and it is recommended to have your patch antenna on that one. What I did with my goggles is open them up and I swapped the UFL connectors. So this Antenna 3 front-facing camera was connected to Antenna 1 internally. And that way I can have two patch antennas on the front. And that's, that's recommended for the best performance. Uh, Gecko FPV, thank you for a two, $2 super chat. I'm not getting very good range on my DJI 03. Why? Gecko, the number one thing you want to be sure of is that it is connected to the flight controller and it is like uh, going out of low power mode. So if you have a working OSD, then you should be good to go. But if you don't have a working on screen display and you haven't connected it to the flight controller correctly, then it could be staying in low power mode and that's going to reduce your range. The other thing I would say is definitely do the FCC hack on your goggles. Well, what if you live in Europe and the FCC hack is not legal? I, I, then, then what I would say is everybody else is just breaking the rules and doing it anyway. And I'm not advising you to do that because it would be irresponsible to advise someone to break the rules. But... I would, it's like, I would acknowledge that everyone else is breaking the rules and I don't see a lot of people getting in trouble for it. So you can decide what you're going to do. Robocopter. Why are the Mr. Steel V5 stout motors so fragile? Thank you for a $2 super chat. Uh, I don't, yeah, good question. Good question. Not touching that with a 10 foot pole. I don't know. I don't have personal experience with those motors. They're called the stout motors, so shouldn't they be extra stout? Uh, I don't know if, objectively speaking, they are fragile. And uh, if they are, then I don't know why. I uh, mostly just leave Mr. Steele's stuff alone over in his little corner of the internet and don't mess with it too much. Um, not because I'm scared. Uh, no. 
I see what I see what you're thinking. You're thinking that Mr. Steele has so he draws so much water in the FPV community that if anybody talks shit about his gear, then a giant crowd of just drama rains down on anyone who does that and that I haven't got the stones to 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 go up against him. That's not true. I mean that is true. Except for the not the, the stones part. That's not true. I have the st I'll do I'm not scared of anybody, but it, he has specific preferences for the way he likes his gear to be. And I have different preferences. And so I just, you know, don't feel a lot of motivation to, you know, and analyze his, his choices. <clears throat> I knew that. I'm just embarrassed. Thank you, Quad City Barrier, for another two dollars. Uh, Bongo, Bongo, Bong POV. Thank you for 126. I don't remember that symbol. Darwin FPV 03 waterproof case keeps overheating the 03 within three minutes of flying. Uh, it doesn't surprise me at all. The 03. Oh, what? I don't. What the frick? Yeah, obviously. Uh, but also, what is this? CNC alloy aluminum waterproof case. So is it supposed to have a thermal pad? I see. Are you are you sure that the thermal pad is making good contact? Because it should be transmitting heat from the DJI to the external case. Have you got it definitely mounted with good co conductivity to the thermal pads? And then the other thing to keep in mind is you still need airflow to cool it or water flow to cool it, right? So I would say make absolutely sure you're getting good connectivity to the thermal pads so that it's transmitting heat to the case. And then the case still needs airflow or something like that. Um, other than that, I don't know what to tell you. I haven't tested this. No, it's definitely not meant to run continuously underwater. It still needs airflow, though. It'll still overheat without airflow. Zip tie an ice cube to it. Good suggestion. That's a terrible suggestion, but I'm, I'm entertained. Is there any reason to get HD0 over Walksnail Avatar for just whoops? Thank you for five pounds. Um... It's a tough one. Is HC HC zero is lighter than Avatar by a little bit. Ah, oh, it's a tough one. That's a tough one. The Walksnail Avatar Whoop VTX isn't terrible. It's a little heavier. There's definitely more choice in bind and flies with HC zero. If you like, if you and a lot of people buying Whoops buy bind and flies. They don't build their own. Some of them do. The other thing to keep in mind is that the the real benefit of walk snail over HD zero is range and penetration. But on tiny whoops, many people don't most many people are going to be running at 25 milliwatts and they're going to be racing. So they're not trying to get exceptional range or penetration in the first place. So the biggest weakness of HD zero, which is lack of range of penetration, actually kind of doesn't apply for a lot of people flying whoops. And HD zero is going to have much better latency. I think I would choose HC0 with, for whoops because a lot of people flying whoops are racing and HC0 is hands down better for racing. I recently got into X class, but it seems like it's dying. Thank you for $5 uh, for the super chat. No frames to be in stock anywhere. Have you noticed this too? Uh, I haven't noticed it because I haven't paid attention to X class in years. So I guess you're right. Uh, I don't know who's running X-Class. I mean, now everybody who was making X-Class gear is making cinema drones instead. So if I wanted to do an X-Class build, I would find a cinema frame that seemed about right. But X-Class was always kind of weird. It was big, like, I think it was one meter frames, but with 13 inch props. It was just arbitrarily large for no reason. 
Let's do something. Thank you for a two dollar super chat. What flight controller or stack do you recommend for Kiss? Um, I don't have a strong recommendation there. I think you've only got a few choices. You've either got the FetTech or the Kiss Ultra, right? And those run different firmware. And so you would ask yourself, you know, check out the Discord for both of them. For example, check out the community, look at the kind of questions people have and the kind of uh, things people are doing with them, and then decide whether you want to buy a FetTech or a Kiss Ultra. I, by the way, I know that FetTech is not Kiss. I know that. I know that historically those trees, those branches come together in the past, and FetTech is a completely original firmware. And I know that sometimes when people ask about Kiss and I throw FetTech in the mix, they object to that. I'm aware of that. I acknowledge that. And now you know that too, in case you didn't. Um, but FetTech came from the same genetics as Kiss originally. And so people who like the way that Kiss flies, some of them went on and now like the way that FetTech is. Okay. So when people ask about Kiss, I throw FetTech in the mix because I think that a lot of people asking about Kiss are, are, would be happy with one or the other. Um, but if you really mean KISS, then KISS Ultra is the way to go. And there's basically not, you know, there's like one or two choices and that's it. Um, that catches us up with the Super Chats. And now we're going to go back to the regular chats. Uh, oh, one more. Peter McKeon. Uh, I did see the Red Bull F1 video with the F with the Dutch drone gods. I won't be showing it on chat because... Uh, on, uh, Red Bull is really aggressive with their copyright stuff, and I don't want to get a copy. They won't strike me, but they'll take all my revenue, and I don't want that. Um, what the Dutch drone gods have done is extraordinary. It is, in my opinion, analogous to the moon landing, to go back to our question about astronauts. It is a monumental thing that required solving a huge number of technical problems. And... and uh, I know that maybe for some people watching this, they think I'm overstating it. They created a drone that can fly at 300 kilometers per hour long enough to finish a circuit of a racetrack, not just one little 20 second run where you peak out at 300 kph and you get your record and you stop. It's able to stay, keep up with an F1 car, 200 to 300 kilometers an hour through the whole course. So it can fly for three or five minutes or however long it takes to finish the lap. And it can maintain video and control link for the whole lap. It is a moonshot accomplishment. Um, I've been told by people who are more familiar with the project that they worked on this for a year, trying to find ESCs that wouldn't blow up and design a drone that could go that fast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's extraordinary. And it would, it's the kind of thing that I have in the past told people, people come to me in my email and they say, well, I want to chase a race car around a track. And I say, you can't do that. I say that that's not possible with today's technology. You have to find another solution because your drone can't keep up with the car on the straights. You'll lose video on the back half of the track. And you can't fly long. And if you do design a drone that can keep up with the car in the straights, it'll have a two-minute flight time and you won't be able to. I, all these reasons. And the Dutch drone gods have proven me wrong. And currently, they are the only people in the world who can do this. Now, other people will, now that they've done it, other people will come along. But it's extraordinary what they've done. And they deserve a huge amount of credit for their ingenuity uh, to, to be able to do this. It's extraordinary. They followed an F1 car for one complete circuit of the track. I was told, uh, Evan Turner told me this yesterday. I didn't know this. He said that the guy had a foot pedal and the, and the, the camera was on a gimbal so that as he slowed down and sped up, he could keep the car in view. And he had a foot pedal for controlling that. Didn't know that. He said that they had repeaters on Mavics hovering, multiple Mavics hovering around the track. And that as the as he flew, a third person would switch which drone he was going through, so he could keep signal throughout the whole run. Just 
simply building a drone that goes 300 kilometers per hour by itself is a world record setting accomplishment. I think the actual world record, I'm not sure they actually broke the world record. They, I, they may have, I'm not sure, but they were certainly on par. But the fact that they not only built a drone that could go as fast as the fastest drones on earth, but also did all this other stuff is, is extraordinary. And, and, uh, you know, when I heard I heard about the Dutch drone gods first when they did this mountain bike downhill run, and I was like, "Oh, Dutch drone gods! Love you, the Dutch drone gods." And now I'm like, "Okay, no, f you, you, okay, drone gods, I bow down. You guys, you guys earned it. You 100 percent earned it." Um, uh, yeah, extraordinary. These guys are extraordinary, and they did something extraordinary. And 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 everybody in the world of FPV and drones should remember this day, because this I really mean it. Like obviously, in terms of the world as a whole, this is not as big a deal as the moon landing. But in terms of FPV drones and what drones can do, I, I honestly this is a moon landing moment, and the world will be divided into. The times before they did this and the times after they did this, I think, in terms of what drones can do. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not exaggerating. I mean it. Anyway. Because uh, it only, it's only going up from here. Um, okay, let's go back to the non-Super Chats. And I want to get this question from Sunshine, which just popped up in the Discord, especially because Sunshine is a patron. Thank you, Sunshine, for being a patron. Um, uh, can you give some pros and cons between Ghost and Express LRS? Okay, so um, Ghost, obviously, easier to use, uh, easier to flash firmware. Express LRS, kind of a pain in the ass to flash firmware. Uh, and no over-the-air updates. You have to flash using a, using a cell phone, a laptop, a computer, or something like that. Fine. Uh, I think you probably already know that. In terms of performance, Ghost maxes out at 250 milliwatts. Express LRS in the boxer goes up to one watt. That is approximately double the range, all else being equal. All else is not equal, but it's approximately double the range. Um uh, Express LRS has, uh, I think, more flexibility in the packet rates you can use. Express LRS has FLRC packet rates. I think Ghost added FLRC. Uh, does Ghost max out at 500 hertz? It's been a little while. Uh, Ghost uh, Express LRS has some of the dual packet rates that send each packet twice for extra link redundant and extra higher LQ, basically. There's a couple of things like that. Uh, but the main advantage you're going to see is that Express LRS is going to be a lot easier to buy receivers for. So you got a lot of built-in Express LRS uh, receivers, whereas Ghost doesn't uh, have as many flight controllers with Ghost built in, barely any. Okay. Let's see here. Hmm. Can a desync on an ESC cause gate timing issues with the FETs, not allowing it to run DSHOT 2400? I'm not sure that the input signal, DSHOT 2400 versus DSHOT 600, I'm not sure that the input signal affects the timing on the output side. I'd be surprised to learn that that was true. And I wouldn't think a desync would make the signal not get there. Um, so no, I don't think it's the D it's D syncs that are causing that the input signal, you know, communicates how fast the motor should spin. And then on the output side, the motor is, sorry, the motor is made to spin, but I don't think those two things are generally related. How 
have you seen the video with F1 versus fastest drone? You still don't like those type of videos. I love those videos. It's just that I get, I lo I, you know, the, the copyright holder takes my revenue if I play those videos on stream and I'm not down for that. Floppy Props asks, how can I configure a Betaflight flight controller to have a two motor tank drive with vertical axis controlling each motor? Um, you, you wouldn't. Betaflight doesn't have a mixer for ground vehicles. Uh, iNav has some ground vehicle mixers and maybe it would work. Um, frankly, you probably, the vertical axis controls each motor. Like you can have one axis on two motors. You might could do it just by passing an aux channel out to the to the ESCs, but the flight controller wouldn't be running them because it doesn't have a mixer for that. I think iNav has ground vehicle uh, mixers that could work for you. FPV Black wants to know, when I use D-Cinelike on the O3, it comes out with a lot of noise and is it grainy. How can I fix this? Yeah. Um, it, what you're, what I'm guessing you're trying to do is you're using the Cinelike profile and then you're trying to lift the shadows. But the problem is that Cinelike, you don't, are you using 10-bit FPV Black? Does the O3 have 10-bit? Bullenty, the O3 has 10-bit, right? Ask the wrong guy, sorry. Yeah, sorry, man. I just I just jump to you whenever I have a question. Uh, DJI O3. So, are you using 10 bit FPV Black? If you're if you're yes, you're using 10 bit. Damn. Okay. Well, that's a tough one. Um, I I have to guess that you're asking too much from the camera and it just can't deliver it. Like, are you locking the ISO? Are you locking the ISO at like 100 or 200? If you're definitely using 10-bit and you're using Cinelog, the one possibility is that your ISO is too high and that's making your video noisy. But the other possibility is that you're just asking too much of the camera. The O3 does not have spectacular low light sensitivity. And so no matter what you do with 10-bit and so on, that's going to give you increased dynamic range, but ultimately the sensitivity is what it is. And you can't, add, you can't get more from the sensor than it's capable of giving you. So you might just need more light. That's, the, that's what I would say. Uh, Isaac Pearson, we have a question about the Flysky FSIA 6B. Earlier in the stream, I did some talking about how to get a Flysky receiver working. Was I don't know if that was the same guy or not, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna call that one good. What's going on here with this question um, from Vladislav? How to flash ELRS without limiting power? Blunty, you cued the question. I wonder if you have an idea of what he's asking. Why would flashing ELRS limit your power? Because you're in the EU mode. That's the only reason I can think. So you would flash yeah. it in an ISRM instead of in the LBG. Yeah. You would flash it with FCC mode instead of... The, is that, the other is thing that he now? might be asking about... Yeah. The other thing yeah. he might be asking about is there's a way to increase the power, like... On the web page or something, right? For certain modules, you can go above yeah. a set in the power. So if it like lists to the certain powers usable in the module, and then you also confirm with the Express LRS developers on the Discord or on the pages that it can go up to there, then you can go in and tweak that setting, I believe. And yeah, then I think a lot of that has been changed in the latest versions to match properly. That's just the Ranger module, I think, and the Bandit. Oh, really? I, think, could do I thought that. there was Not... one other one. Okay. I think I don't think so. Okay. Um. Yeah, but I you make sure you're flashing to the FCC region and not the EU region. But other than that, I don't see why it would limit power. Klaus Anderson says, while you're on the topic of ELRS, why is ELRS so superior to other systems? Why didn't established companies come up with this? Um, as far as why ELRS is superior, uh, 
I've, I've talked about this before, so I don't want to spend 20 minutes. Now I will probably spend 20 minutes doing it every time I say that. ELRS is optimized for long range and low latency. It has been sort of shaved down to the bare minimum. So there are convenience features that other thing, other systems have that it doesn't have, like over-the-air flashing, for example, um, like Mavlink telemetry support, like Crossfire has, although they're, they're working on something like that. Um, what, but the, as far as why it's better, the short answer is that you will get longer range, milliwatt for milliwatt, out of Express LRS. It has faster packet rates for lower latency because it was designed for that from, from the ground up. And, uh, and because it's open source, there's widespread availability of hardware. Those are the three main reasons I think it's superior. Um, uh, but um, as far as why didn't anyone else do this? Well, the answer is that they started with different priorities. Um, Crossfire is much easier to use. It's much more accessible in terms of firmware updates and flashing and binding. It's, it's much easier to use, okay? Uh, and uh, Ghost, likewise, much easier to use. So it just means that they started with different priorities. And sometimes when you're an open source project and you don't have to worry about selling to customers, you can make decisions that turn out to be better decisions for customers. Also, when you're an open source project and you don't actually care about the, I shouldn't say care, when you're an open source project and your primary job is to develop the software and somebody else develops the hardware, it's possible to sell that hardware for a lower price, right? And that gives you an advantage. Um, but like, if you look at Crossfire, Crossfire at the time that it came out was lower latency than everything else by a huge amount. It was half the latency of other stuff and had 10 times or 20 times the range easily. Crossfire was so much better than everything else. And so they made some decisions about how to design Crossfire and they were the best. And then the market continued to evolve so that five years later, Along comes Express LRS, and suddenly it's doing things that Crossfire didn't do. And now Crossfire is no longer the best. Well, some people feel that Crossfire is still the best. That's you know, but there's ways in which Express LRS is better than Crossfire. And at this point, TBS would have to literally start from scratch in order to do the things that, you know, for example, for Crossfire to have lower latency than Express LRS they would have to go back to the drawing board and redesign it, not maybe not entirely from scratch, but they would have to really think about their assumptions and redesign it to be lower latency because they have made decisions in the past that they are now locked into, you see? And so one of the reasons why Express LRS is better is just because it's newer and they were not constrained by decisions made in the past. And five years from now, who knows? Express LRS may be locked in by decisions they made and unable to adapt to a changing marketplace, and someone else may come along and eat their lunch. Don't know. What RTF kit would you recommend for a beginner? I'm thinking about the Tiny Hawk 3 Freestyle. That's a great choice. That's a great choice. Um, it's certainly one of the ones I would recommend. Tiny Hawk 3 Freestyle, solid RTF kit. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't steer you away from that. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, quite a few people in chat got upset about some when I, I would I don't say I'm not gonna say upset, but we're like, do not buy an RTF. Buy everything individually. Like quite a few people in chat all said that at the same time. Like, how do you feel about that statement? I mean, I get it. I, I think that if you get into FPV, eventually you have to learn how to build. Okay, let's start there. Because if you get into FPV, you will break your drone. It's not like a DJI drone where most of the time you don't expect to crash it. And if you do occasionally crash it, you send it to DJI for repair. OK, you're going to crash your FPV drone all the time. It's going to break and there will be no one to fix it for you except you. 
So either you will learn to fix your own drones or you will get out of the hobby because you can't afford to keep buying new drones. And very rarely I have met a person who is so wealthy that when they break a drone, they just buy a new one and they have 15 broken drones and one of them's got a broken motor and one of them's got like, they're barely broken. And on some part of my soul just cries for the waste. Like if you could only learn to solder, you could have saved yourself $5,000. And they're just like, nah, that's an exception though. So, but it doesn't mean that the right choice for everybody is to start by building their own drone because building a drone is an enormous learning curve. And there are people who wanted to get into FPV who decided that they needed to build their own drone and they got so frustrated and discouraged that they never finished and they never got into FPV. And if that person had just had something to fly in the meantime, maybe they would have stuck it out. Maybe they wouldn't. So when someone says, I want to get into FPV and I'm going to buy a bind and fly, I don't immediately discourage them. I think, cool. Now, the very next thing you should do is you should start learning to build a drone so that when you break your bind and fly, you can fix it. You got to learn to build eventually, but it doesn't mean that you need to start out learning to build. That's my opinion. So I might have conveyed that poorly, but also the other half of the question was, should they be buying a garbage controller and goggles that they're not going to use later down the line in an RTF kit? Shouldn't you just be buying something you can use later? Because if you're going to do it, you're going to do it or you're not, you're not. Right. I think I that's would, kind of the idea, right? I would rather you buy the Tiny Hawk Freestyle and a Radio Master Pocket. Again, sorry for banging the mic, guys. Uh, I would rather you buy... Talk with my hands. Part Italian. I would rather you buy a Radio Master Pocket or a Radio Master Boxer or a Radio Master TX-16S or some controller you can grow with. If you buy the garbage goggles and the garbage controller, like the Emacs goggles are not total trash, but the Emacs controller is kind of trash. Y you know, um, but that's the kind of thing where like, I feel like having it all come in one kit. Like the thing, what, what ultimately what I want you to do is I want you to get into the hobby and enjoy it. And if the right way to do that is you buy a, a bind and fly kit, like a beta FPV Cetus, as long as you get enough use out of that, that you're hooked and you want to keep going, it did its job. Okay. And, and the thing is like, it's tough to know who, where you, cause like if I say, oh yeah, but don't buy this all in one kit. Buy the freestyle, but then you got to buy the Radio Master Pocket controller, and you got to buy the Eashin EV800D goggles, and a, but then you got to bind the controller, and then you got to check the channel mapping, and you got to learn about OpenTX and HTX. Some people are going to be like, ah, forget it. And maybe those people just, maybe they were, maybe they don't belong in the hobby in the first place. Because, you know, that moment where you're like, ah, forget it. Maybe that's going to come. But a lot of people, they're going to buy that bind and fly kit. They're going to freaking love it and they're going to be hooked. And then when their controller is garbage and they buy the Radio Master Pocket, now they're hooked and they want to figure out how to make it work. So it's tough to know. Yes, you wasted a little bit mo of money on that controller that's crappy and you're going to throw it away and you're never going to see it again. But if I had forced you to do the right thing in the first place, maybe you never would have done it at all. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't prejudge the right way. There's a, there's a different answer for every person. And I don't prejudge that one of these answers is correct. So, so you need to hear both sides of the story. You as a person getting into the hobby need to hear from people who say, oh God, don't buy that. It's trash and it's going to die on you. You should buy a Radio Master Pocket. And you need to hear from people who are like, oh, yeah, I just bought a Bind to Fly. It was great. You need to hear from both sides and decide who you are. There's not a one right answer. Why does the DJI camera have shitty dynamic range? Don't know. Just does. Something about the sensor. I see no reason to use the Action 2 if you have an 803, as they both suck. Yup. Doesn't have great dynamic range. Don't know why. Just doesn't. I mean, DJI can make good cameras, right? There are exceptional cameras on some of the Mavics, 
uh, you know, you know, they they have made some exceptional cameras, but the O3 and the Action have really poor dynamic range. Zero taste guy, I wasn't in angle mode when I was doing those moves where the front end was dropping out. I was in acro mode. I I, I would like to I would like to say I one thousand percent fly whoops in acro mode all the time. But for the super tight race scout courses, I can't do it. It's too tight. I'm just that's my limit. When I'm not doing like last night I went to a whoop race in a gymnasium. And it was a whoop race, but it was still a relatively open track. And I flew it in acro mode, of course. It was only angle mode for the ultra tight stuff like Race Gal. Hmm. What's the length of the copper antenna on a Mobula 6 Free Sky Edition? Um, 31 millimeters. Is it 31 millimeters for a 2.4 gigahertz antenna? And then like, that's a good question. I don't know. I'm pretty sure for a 2.4 gigahertz receiver, it's 31 millimeters. How come there's no dual antenna analog VTXs? Uh, because analog systems, it's not a diversity system. Like the DJI system with the dual, with the multiple antennas, it is a digital MIMO system, multiple in, multiple out. It's designed, but these analog systems, MIMO didn't exist. So it's just an old standard. Um, yeah. Let's see here. And the, and the other thing is, if you put two antennas, you'd have the power, right? Well, if you just like took... Like, you'd have to two... have double the PAs or whatever. Yeah, you'd need two amplifiers. No, it would make no sense to have two antennas transmitting from the same amplifier. That would just screw up your coverage pattern. It would make no sense. Transmit diversity doesn't work like that. Receive diversity doesn't work like that either. You would always transmit to one or the other antenna, or you would have two amplifiers transmitting at the same time, but that would still have some weird effects. Uh, yeah, no. Transmitting on multiple antennas requires additional technology that our analog VTXs don't have. Otherwise, it doesn't work like you think. There was, gosh, there was an AKK Alpha. Oh, here it is. No, no, that's different. Sorry. There was an AKK VTX with two antennas in parallel, and I have no idea what they thought they were doing, but it was a stupid idea and it didn't work. And I know people are saying, well, you didn't test it. How do you know? And it's like, if you show me a car and the car has triangular wheels, I don't need to test it to know that doesn't work, right? Like the fundamentals of RF transmission systems say that you can't just put two antennas in parallel and have it like magically be better. It doesn't work like that. Yep, there it is. Thank you, Blunty, for pulling that up. Like, when I first saw this, I thought, what's going on here? Do they have two amplifiers? In which case, it could theoretically do something interesting. I don't remember if somebody tested it or I didn't test it. I never got it. Did I test it? I don't know. But this was just two antennas in parallel. And that's just like, no, no. What? No. Stop. Bad. It breaks entirely the old design and structures. Yeah, it breaks them all right. Unprecedented. Strong. And hand, so basically, how I remember this. It transmits both left hand and right hand at the same time. If you transmit the same signal, left hand and right hand, out of two antennas, do you know what you get? You get a linear signal. They cancel each other out and it becomes linear. How how do you not know that? You're designing the VTX. This crazy idea that keeps coming back that that if you transmit left and right at the same time, magically it'll be better. It's not. It's BS. It's just, and I don't, it's, and it's just manufacturers trying to prey on the ignorance of their customers. 
and no, this is not offensive. Customers don't know about a radio antenna design principles. They shouldn't have to. So they just hear these, and it's buzzwords, and they and and it's 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 predatory of manufacturers to do this. You're selling an objectively worse product that doesn't do what you suggest it does to people who don't know that. That's unethical. The best interpretation of this VTX is that AKK is also dumb enough to not know that this doesn't do what they think it does. And they are, it doesn't make it okay, but it means that instead of being predatory, they're just dumb. Can you check the pin? Let's go, let's move there since what's since, that? Uh, check since where, we're already what? on the AKK topic. I pinned a comment. Okay. What do you think about the new AKK ten watt VTX? Jesus, that's a lot of freaking power. I mean, that's the most well, I've heard by what like here four or six watts. August board of new VTXs from AKK Tech. If you're unfamiliar. with so we'll start by saying that this is not legal to use in the U.S. Aircraft are limited to one watt. The only way that they can sell this in the U.S. is either they're just flying under the radar or they are avoiding specifying that it's for aircraft. Um, it's not just like Army getting into like small broadcast station territory with 10 watts. 10, 10 watts is a lot. I think it's like a classifying as a minor broadcast station. I don't know about that. I mean, if you're if you're a ham operator... What's the max output? Can you go up to 10 watts? I would think that you could. I'm not sure. I know when I was looking at like what TV stations are and stuff, it was like a small T, uh, there's a very small category. It's like 10 to well, we're, 20 watts. Yeah, but we're still in, we're still in the, the ham band. So that the right. raw, what's the max output power? Part 97 max output power. 900 megahertz, 5.8 gigahertz, non-spread spectrum, but this is spread spectrum. No, this is non-spread spectrum. I'm sorry. Wait, this is a, oh, this is a, I'm sorry. This is an analog transmitter. Does anyone know? Capital C, is that, is that for a, for an analog transmitter like this, 50 watts? Yeah. Max output power, 5.8 gigahertz. Oh, here we go. I've seen a table that says I can transmit up to one watt, up to, isn't it hand power? Non-licensed part 15 equipment is one watt to the antenna, maximum ERPS four watts. That doesn't sound right. No, those are Wi-Fi limits. That's for, that's for part 15, unlicensed wireless equipment operating the IS, that's an ISM though. So we're not operating in the ISM band. We're operating under part 97. We're not ISM equipment. Even though our frequencies are in this range, we're operating under under ham rules, not ISM rules. So the fact that we're not in the ISM band, we're in the ham radio band. Uh, 1500 watts is the maximum unless otherwise stated. 1500 watts, Jesus. This is not an ISM band. I believe that's a mistake. So you've got the, the ISM band and then you've got the ham radio band, the part 97 band. And the frequencies of those bands overlap. But it's like, here's the analogy. Let's say I'm a commercial trucker and I'm driving on the interstate. Even though I'm driving on the same interstate road as other cars, I'm operating under different rules because I'm a commercial, I'm a CDL trucker, right? So the ham band and the ISM band overlap. But if I am operating under part 97 rules, the fact that I am operating in a frequency that is also covered by the ISM band doesn't matter. I am not operating under ISM rules. So people here are quoting ISM rules, and I don't think that's correct. Yeah, here we go. This guy's got the right answer. It's It falls within the amateur band, 1,500 watts, as long as you follow amateur. ISM equipment is license-free, and that's correct. That's the correct answer. So, so uh, going back, uh, nitpicking regulations. Um, I do think if you're operating under Part 97... 
And the other the other rule is an FCC rule that limits uh, aircraft to one watt telecommand of an aircraft to one watt. And that does apply to VTXs. So the FCC would still say you're violating a rule here. Um, but setting that aside, freaking 10 watts, it's going to go, um, it's going to go real freaking far. These are monstrous. I mean, I don't think a typical hobbyist is going to be choosing these. These are going to be for long range pilots and I, I think we all know which long-range pilots they're meaning to sell to. Uh, there's been a sudden interest in long-range lately. I don't know why that could be. Just all of a sudden, we got a bunch of high-powered VTXs, a bunch of 7-inch, 8-inch, 10-inch builds. So strange. So strange. Do you think the price makes sense is 160 I mean, sure. I mean, the price could be whatever they want it to be. No one else is making a 10-watt VTX. <laughs> I think AKK is the only ones making what, like a three watt or four watt, right? I mean, they they seem to be the ones yeah. that always push, put a giant fan on something and crank it up. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, geez, I can only imagine how much. What? How big is this? Uh, uh, what is it? Freaking, not an amplifier. The other one, <laughs> a resistor, not a resistor. What the hell is it called? Load load resistor. What's the actual name of this? freaking thing i'm blanking i hate myself right now it's got to be at least 10 db attenuator got it 10 db attenuator ah uh, i'm losing my english 160 bucks yeah it's clearly too big for a typical like mini quad and 10 watts is way too much power it's a shocking amount of power it's an extraordinary amount of power Pretty freaking cool. Thank you for telling me. I didn't know this existed.